you saying the disclaimer because I do not want to get in trouble. Just to make sure, Stardust is a fairy tale for adults. The first several chapters are, um, they have um, sexual content that I did not read in my channel. I did not read it. Um, so just to let you know, because if parents want to get this for their kids, it's a fairy tale for adults. They have a movie. They can watch the movie better than they can read the book. Um, so just to let you guys know, that's that. This book is written by Neil Gaiman. Um, I like him. Um, but some of these things are a little, they can get a little raunchy at times. So, um, my husband makes sure that I can read it online. Especially because I don't like raunchy books. And I, this is my channel, so I do not want to read raunchy books if I don't like them. So, anyways, anyways. Gotta fix my mic. You can hear me right, 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 right. Okay, so let's get started with part two of chapter eight. Like always, I'm going to show you the pictures. mostly gray and her face was pouched and wrinkled at the throat and her and eyes at the corners of the mouth what her hair was mostly gray and her face was pouched and wrinkled at the throat and eyes and at the corners of the mouth there was no color to her face although her skirt was vivid bloody splash of scarlet. It had been ripped at, at the shoulder and beneath the rib could be seen puckered and obscene. A deep scar. The wind whipped her hair about her face as she drove the black carriage on through the barrens. The stallions stumbled often. Thick sweat dripped from their flanks and bloody foam dripped from their lips. Still, their hooves pounded along the muddy path through the bar barrens. There all were nothing gross. The witch queen, oldest of the Lilim, reigned in the horses beside the pinnacle of rock, the color of verdigris, which juted from the marshy soil of the barrens like a needle. Then, as slowly as might be expected, from the any lady no longer in her first or even her second youth, she climbed down from the driver's seat to wet earth. To the wet earth, she walked around the coach and opened the door. And head of the dead unicorn, her dagger still in its cold eye socket, flopped down as she did so. The witch clamored up into a coach and pulled open the unicorn's mouth. Rigor mortis was starting to set in in the jaw open and the jaw open only with difficulty. The witch woman bit down hard and her at her on her own tongue bit hard enough that the pain was melted metal sharp in her mouth bit down until she could taste the blood. She swirled it around in her mouth, mixing the blood with spittle. She could feel that several of her front teeth were beginning to come loose. Then she spat onto the dead unicorn's uh, piebald tongue. Blood flecked her lips and chin. She grunted several syllables that should, um, shall not be recorded here. And she pushed the unicorn's mouth closed once more. She, I mean, get out of the coach, she told the dead beast. Stiffly, awkwardly, the unicorn raised its head, then it moved its legs like a newborn flow, full or fawn just learning to walk, and it twitched and pushed. 
push itself up onto the whole force and it half climbing, half falling, it tumbled out of the carriage door and onto the mud where it raised itself to its feet, its left side upon which it, it had lain in the coach was swollen and dark with blood and fluids, half blind the dead unicorn stumbled up stumbled to the base of the green rock needle until it reached the de a depression in the rock where it dropped its knees of its four legs in a ghastly parody of prayer the witch queen reached down and pulled her knife out of the beast's eye socket she sliced across its throat blood began to slowly to ooze from the gash she had made she walked back to the carriage and returned her returned with her um, cleaver. Then she began to hack the unicorn's neck until she had separated it from its body, and the severed head tumbled into the rock hollow, now filling with dark red puddle of brackish blood. She took a unicorn's she took the unicorn's head with the horn and placed it by beside the body of the rock. Thereupon she looked with her heart gray eyes into the red pool. She had made two faces stare out at her from the puddle, two women older by far in appearance than she was. Now, where is she? asked the first face peevishly. What have you done with her? Look at you, said the second of the lilim. You took the last of your youth we had saved. I tore it from the star's breast myself long long ago, though she screamed and writhed and carried on ever so. From the looks of you, you've squared it most of the youth already. Squandered, sorry, squandered most of the youth already. I came so close, said the witch woman to her sister in the pool, but she had a unicorn to protect her. Now I have the unicorn's head, and I will bring it back with me. For it's long enough since we had fresh crown unicorn horn in our arts. Unicorn's horn be damned, said her youngest sister. What about the star, I cannot find her. It's almost as if she were no longer in fairy. There was a pause. No, said, no, said one of their sisters. She's still in fairy, but she is going to the market of that wall, and that is too close to the world on the other side of the wall. Once she goes into that world, she will be lost to us, for they each of them knew that were the star to cross the wall, and to enter the world of things as they are, she would become an instant, no more than a pitted lump of metallic rock that off that had fallen once from the heavens, cold and dead, and no more use to them. Then I shall go to Diggory Dyke and wait there, for all who pass on the way to wall must go by of Diggory Dyke. The reflection of the two old women gazed disapprovingly out of the pool. The witch queen ran her tongue over her teeth. That one, that one at the top will be out by nightfall, she thought. The way it wobbles so. And then she spat into a bloody pool. The ripples spread across it, erasing all traces of the lilim. Now the pool reflected only the sky over the barrens and the faint white clouds far above them. She kicked the headless corpse and uh, of the unicorn so it tumbled over onto its side. Then she took up its head and she carried it with her up to the driver's seat. She placed it beside her, picked up the reins and whipped the re uh, restive horses into the tired trot. Tristan sat at the top of the Tower of the Cloud and wondered why none of the heroes of the Penny Dreadfuls he used to read so 
avidly were ever hungry. His stomach rumbled and his hand hurt him so. Adventures are all very well in their place, he thought, but there's a lot to be said for regular meals and freedom of from, from pain. Still, he was alive, and the wind was in the, his hair, and the cloud was scudding through the sky like a galleon at full sail, and looking out over the world from above that he knew he could never remember feeling so alive as he did at the moment. There was a skyness to the sky, and a nowness to the world that he may, he had never seen or felt or realized before. He understood that he was in some way above his problems, just as he was above the world. The pain in his hand was a long way away. He thought of, about his actions and his adventures and about the journey ahead of him, and it seemed to Tristan that the whole business was suddenly very small and very straightforward. He stood up on the cloud spire and called, Hello! Several times and loudly as he could, he even waved his tunic over his head, feeling a little foolish as he did so. Then the clamor down the spire, ten feet from the bottom, he missed his footing and fell into a misty softness of the cloud. Where, well, what were you shouting about? asked Yvain. To let people know we were here, Tristan told her. What people? You never know, he told her. Better I should call to people who aren't there than that people who are there should miss us because I didn't say anything. She said nothing in it reply to this. I've been thinking, said Tristan, and what I've been thinking is this. After we're done with what I need, got you back to Wall, giving you to Victoria Forrester, perhaps we could do what you need, what I need. Well, you want to go back, don't you, up in the sky to, to shine again at night so we can sort that out. She looked up at him and took her head and shook her head. That doesn't happen, she explained. Stars fall. Then don't go back up again. You could be the first, he told her. You have to believe otherwise. It will never happen. It will never happen, she told him. No more than your shouting is going to attract anyone. Up here, where there isn't anyone, it doesn't matter if I believe it or not. That's just the way things are. How's your hand? He shrugged. Hurts, he said. How's your leg? Hurts, she said. But not as badly as it did before. Ahoy, came a voice from the from far above them. Ahoy, down there. Parties in the need of assistance. Hit the bell for notifications and I will talk to you in my next video. Bye guys.